Hello, everyone. My name is Angie Peacock. I'm a psychiatric drug withdrawal consultant and healing coach. Today, we are speaking with Kiara Fanload. I said it right, right? Kiara. Kira. Kira. I like Kira. my little I joke that I always tell people is it's pronounced like Kira Knightley, but the nightly is silent. But the nightly is silent. Kira, Kira. Fanlow. Her and I have a mutual friend, and that is who connected us. And we had a conversation previously, and we couldn't stop talking, and we had to cut each other off. <laughs> like, okay, that's enough. We're going to be exhausted. So I said, I said to her, let me just bring you on Facebook Live. We can talk more about this. We can inspire others. It's going to be a really engaging conversation. So thank you for uh, being here. So welcome, Kira. Thank you, Angie. I'm so happy to be here. So let me read her bio really quick. It's pretty impressive. Kira Fanlow is a writer and the founder of Homing Instinct, a platform that offers support for teens and their families. As a child and teen, Kira felt depressed, anxious, was self-harming and suicidal. She went to countless therapists, took over a dozen of medications and was sent to a hospital, wilderness therapy and a therapeutic boarding school. While she had some healing experiences, she largely felt that psychiatric and residential healthcare systems failed to address the root causes and acknowledge the humanity and innate wisdom of teens. After leaving treatment, Kira co committed to recovery on a different path. She came off all her medications, repaired her relationships with family, and graduated college with honors. She worked in different therapeutic settings and a couple large tech companies before deciding to devote her life to guiding teens. She now uses her experiences and insight to support teens in their healing. She also works with parents and shares writing on mental health and well-being. You can learn more about Kira Fanlow on Instagram at mm -hmm. C-I-A-R-A Fanlow or her website, www.hominginstinct.org. What do you think when I read all that? I was just like, it's so, it's, it's when you like hear, um, sometimes like someone say your name and they're talking to someone else and I'm like, oh, I'm like a person that people think about. Like, so it was just interesting here. I've never heard someone like read my bio before. Amazing. Yeah. This is her first interview guys. I'm so honored to let her, she let, she's letting me talk to her first, but it, to me, when I read your bio, even when I read it in preparation for this, there was a few uh -huh. things that really stood out to me, like mm -hmm. therapeutic boarding school. I was like, yeah. that's a thing. I never heard of such a thing. And you know, you're going to talk about this in a minute, but things like while you had some healing experiences, it didn't cure you. So these things, I think we're going to talk about all of them today, but let's, yeah. so let's just get started there. Like, tell us your story. Like what happened? what led you to the mental health system? How did it go? And what made you leave? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's so funny. It's like I used to, obviously, as I said, I went to so many different therapists throughout my life. And I used to like wish that I just had a pamphlet or like PowerPoint deck. I could just be like, here, like, here's the story because it's so long. And I'm going to try my best to like make this a little bit more bite-sized because I could spend like 10 hours talking about this. Yeah. So I first started going to therapy when I was eight. So I started when I was pretty young and I went on and off kind of throughout K through, or sorry, not K through maybe like third to eighth grade. Um, and I went to maybe like four or five different therapists and I didn't really have a meaningful connection with any of them. And I also, I was pretty mature as a child, but I didn't really have the language to articulate what I was going through. And I didn't trust any of them enough to actually share honestly. So I just say that to give some context, like I had had challenges from the time I was very young, but when I got to high school, it was just but wait, like, wait, wait, we should stop yeah. there for a second because yeah. when I hear you were eight years old, like, why would you need therapy as an eight-year-old? Please help me understand that. Like what, Yeah, I was. what was happening? Really? I was a really sad kid. I had a hard time making friends. Um, I was very anxious. I was very angry had really intense emotions and often talked about wanting to die. Mm. So I think so my that's what, that's what it was. Your, it was too much for your parents to handle. They didn't know what to do. Yeah. 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 And then they got divorced when I was nine. So then I felt even more afraid and anxious and like closed off. Mm -hmm. um, and I started cutting when I was 10 wow. um, and that was mostly I don't want to say like, wasn't, it, it was a big deal, but it was, I was like private about it at that point. Um, so I did go to therapy. I started taking ADHD medication when I was 12. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was really, it was not very intense in my life. Like the med the mental health care system when I was a kid. Yeah. But when I got to high school, 
it was just like, I couldn't keep it together anymore. Like I was so, so insecure. I was constantly thinking like, I'm not, I'm not smart enough. I'm talentless. I'm worthless. I, no one likes me. I don't belong anywhere. There's no point to life. Like, I don't think I'll ever feel happy. I hated everything about myself. And like that just consumed all of my thoughts. And I would just like loop on all of these thoughts all the time and, you know, do anything that I could to just try and feel okay, which Mm -hmm. was self-harming or like struggling with food, like doing unsafe things. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, I went to my school counselor and I was like, Hey, like, I'm really like, like something's wrong. Like I shouldn't be feeling this way all the time. Right. And he was kind of like, okay, like maybe, you know, you're just having like some growing pains, like high school is it's tough for everyone. Like, I don't know anyone who's like high school is the best time of my life. <laughs> if that's the case, like, I don't trust you. No. <laughs> and then I went to him like a few weeks later and I had cuts on my arm and he was like, like, so I could tell he was like actually taking me seriously, which is something we can like come back to. But I think that that's a challenge, like people not feeling like they're sick enough sometimes, like especially teenagers and like almost resorting to really extreme acts to try and demonstrate how much they're suffering. Yes. So that to me was something in my mind where I'm like, oh, like people take this more seriously if I'm doing something really dangerous. Mm-hmm. So he started me on meds. I started taking Lexapro and Wellbutrin and obviously you and I know, and I think probably a lot of people watching know too, there's a lot more awareness about this, but it's, there, it's not a chemical imbalance, but at that point, that's how it was presented to me. And so mm-hmm. I thought depression was as, you know, like discernible as being tested for diabetes. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take this and I feel better. Obviously that was not happening. So we increased the doses and increased the doses and then we switched and then we increased those and we switched again. So that was like one piece that was happening in the background was the medication. And I was, you know, doing talk therapy and all that. And things were just getting worse and worse. Like every time I thought I had like hit rock bottom, like it just got lower. Um, and so my parents eventually, like I took a medical leave from school because I I had made a suicide attempt and I wasn't, I wasn't going to school anyway. Like I wasn't doing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went to a psychiatric hospital and I was there for six weeks and it's, well, I guess I don't want to assume like what context people have, but it's like what you would think a psych hospital is like, like if you've seen actually looked just like the hospital and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, like it was wow. crazy just, yeah, it's like this big old, like white building. And it was mostly just like sitting around, you know, there's like no, no privacy. If I was in the bathroom, taking a shower and I was taking too much time, like someone would just like come in and like check on me. Like you couldn't lock any doors. You couldn't go outside. The only time we would be outside is taking the bus from like our ward over to the main building, like to get a meal. And it was, you know, group therapy, a lot of supervision and the medication was a really big part of that process too, because, um, I think like their theory was because they had like supervision, they could make really drastic adjustments, like just take you off something and just put you on something and add this in and increase that because they had people like monitoring you all the time. So I went in on three and I left on six meds. And six different ones. Like I came off all of those three and went on six different ones. Mm -hmm. And I remember like when I was in kind of like at the end of the time in my hospital, because it was like, you know, a program that you completed the modules for. I remember thinking like in my mind at that point, that was what someone does when you're depressed. Like you take meds and you do therapy. And I was like, I've been living in a residential facility, taking a ton of meds and doing a ton of therapy. And I still feel miserable. Like I must be like broken beyond repair because this is like the, to me, that was like the most extreme intervention someone could do. Like you go live in a hospital and I left and I I really did not feel any different, but I came home on a home contract, which is a pretty standard practice in treatment. It's like the person comes home agreeing to a list of conditions. Like I'm going to stay sober. I'm going to check in about where I am. I'm not going to see this person, whatever it is. And so I came home on one of those 
And like three weeks later, I broke like literally all of the rules yeah, and most of, of them in like one day. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and, um, maybe like a week or so after that, my mom was like, Hey, I'm sending you on a camping trip. And I was kind of like, okay, That's random. Like, I didn't, yeah. this, so it was wilderness therapy. She was talking yeah, about, but yeah. I had no idea that that was, that, that it was a thing. Like most mm-hmm. people, unless you know someone like you would not even know that exists. So like at that point, like alarm bells weren't really going up. I was just kind of like, she's probably sending me on some sort of, cause there's so many just like out regular retreat out- or yeah, girls, you know, totally. who knows, who knows? Girls you wouldn't retreat. think like a psych ward in the woods, you know? Exactly. <laughs> you would not, cause you don't know that it even exists to like put it no. in that context. Like right. exactly. So she tells me I'm going there. And like, I honestly thought like, she just wants a break because like our relationship is great now, but it was so tense. So I was like, she just needs to be like away from me for a little bit. So I get on a plane and I fly to Colorado, which is where I live now. And kind of like some senses started kicking in. Like, I remember I was like, it's really weird that my mom told me not to bring anything. Like, why would I not bring like, you know, underwear or like a hat or something? Like, why did she say like, don't bring, just bring like, you know, water for the plane or whatever. So I was kind of, that's like kind of weird. And then, you know, I get picked up at the airport by these escorts and I was just like, where are all the other kids? Uh-oh. Like, why, why is it just me? And then they take me to this warehouse and there were two moments it like said in the first one where I was kind of like, okay, like this is not, this is not what I thought it was. I like went to the bathroom and one of them came with me and, and they put their heel like in the door so I couldn't lock it. Oh my God. And I was like, that's so weird. I was like, why are you, what are like, why are you doing that? And then, you know, I go back and they strip search me. And that's when I was like, okay, this is, this not, is not a camping program. This is something else. I don't know what this is. How did you feel in that moment? Like you're like, you're feeling towards your parents or you're feeling what is about to happen to you. I felt at that point, like pure um, terror. And like my mind is, I, I think if I would have to say in that moment, in terms of like fight, flight or freeze, it was fight. And not that I actually like resisted, but in my mind, I was like, how am I going to get out of this? Like, I was already starting to think I was like running these like routes in my mind. And when we got in the car, I was like, I wonder if I should like, if I could like break the window, window. I was like, you know, I wonder if I could like pretend to be, you know, having a seizure and they'd take me to hospital. Like I was just running through all these scenarios. Oh my God. Um, and even then I didn't know the gravity of what I was getting into, but I just knew like they're bringing me to the middle of nowhere and they, they gave me the stuff. Like, I don't have a cell phone. I don't have anything. They took everything down to like, you know, the lip balm I had in my pocket. And I just have the clothes that they've given me. And they don't give you a backpack either. When you first get there, you have to earn a backpack. So all of my stuff, like the sleeping bag is like wrapped up in a tarp. And like, that's all that I have. So they drive me out to the middle of nowhere and leave me with this group. And for those who like are not familiar with wilderness therapy, it's basically backpacking with therapeutic elements. So, and if people don't know what backpacking is, you're in the woods or in the mountains, you're in nature and you're carrying all of your stuff on your back, like your sleeping bag and food and all that. And you hike and you set up camp and you sleep and then you hike some more. So that was really the- and Wait, do they like stop you? Yeah, cause I'm gonna go into this a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Like stop you and say like, let's talk about how you're feeling right now. Like, are your feet tired or is your back heavy? That's, that's a metaphor for how much you're carrying in your life. (laughs) Like, Angie, were you there? (laughs) No, but I've done enough. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like everything is a teachable moment, you know, everybody's so emotional about it and it's so dramatic. And like one person will react and, oh, is this how you react at home in your context? Like, like, tell me, how was it? Like, give me, you know, a story or something. No, you completely nailed it. Like it was, (laughs) It was, it was like, you know, a little like, and I loved that. Like, honestly, I didn't the beginning at the beginning. I was like, all you people are like crazy hippies. Like this is bananas to me, but I ended up loving it. But everything was a teachable moment. I remember there was like one day this girl was like, she had only, she was carrying, she found like two rocks that she thought were really cool. And so she put them in her backpack. And one of the guides is like, what do these represent? Like, what are you like, like what baggage are you like? caring with you and attached to it. And I'm like, dude, I think they're just like cool looking crystals. Like, like, 
that's that's all it is it's not that deep <laughs> just like the rocks <laughs> yeah. it was that deep sometimes there would be um I think okay actually I'll talk about this a little bit because I think the metaphors were valuable I mean definitely humorous at points where I was like we all need to just kind of calm down about this <laughs> but sometimes they were really interesting ways to see into someone's challenges mm -hmm. so a big part of being there was learning how to live in nature. Like you learn how to build shelter. You learn how to like read a map. And the major way that someone kind of showed their progress was making fire with a bow drill set. So that's like a very primitive way of making fire. It's like you have wood and a spindle and you have a bow and a top rock and you go like this. Yeah. And then you get an ember and you like blow it up. So they use that as a way to see, you know, how do you approach challenge in your life? And it was like fair, like, you know, some kids, it did really show like, okay, they really um, resist things that are difficult and either like they find excuses or they blame themselves or they are committed to be like, oh, I just can't do this. I can't learn this. Like I'm not smart enough. So there were like tools like that, that I think would help people feel like a sense of accomplishment because they could see, oh, this is how I approach challenge in life and this is how I overcome it. Um, and then there was also, you know, like the part of it that felt like really silly at times. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Like, um, we, we had so many running jokes about like, it would rain and, you know, the guides would be like, what does this mean for like you and your process? And I'd be like, I'm wet. Like it's rained. That's That's it. it. <laughs> there's nothing else to it. I'm cold and wet. I'm oh my gosh. Yeah. So for people out there, there's a really good, um, documentary about this. Paris Hilton did it of all people, but about the troubled teen industry. So if you're more interested in wilderness therapy, go check I don't know the name of the film I can't remember but I think it's it this is Paris this is Paris is that it and, so and, like yeah and and Paris's experience was that she was forced drugged against her will in these sort of camps um she kind of just highlights like the profit it's a profit you know this is a capitalism like how do we yeah like money yeah. off teens and it's not really helpful or traumatizes them further or leads to more pathology pathologization of their personality and who they are and they're just trying to figure out life or however they got there but it's it's disturbing to me and I know I, I feel bad for parents because it's like their choices are very limited so I've talked to lots of parents at this point and they'll they'll say to me like we tried all the meds we tried yeah. all the programs my kid has been in every psych hospital in this whole town we mm -hmm. are out of options nobody knows what to do with us they won't even admit us anymore what do we do yeah so places like this spring yeah. up and they send their kid off and they get a respite and the kid doesn't necessarily get any better so I don't know what can you say about all that because I see it all the time it's really depressing I, I totally agree with what you said. I think there's two groups of, well, there's probably more than that, but from my experience, I kind of saw there were like two groups of parents. There was the group of parents who kind of wanted to like outsource the problem. And they were like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, I just need someone else to manage this. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably we've talked about this before too, like reflects a lot of how like our culture thinks about these challenges like it's like a flaw in the individual and I think like families think that too like one kid kind of becomes the designated like black sheep or problem child and they think that they can just like send that person away to get fixed mm -hmm. without realizing like there's like a whole family system and yes. community and like culture at play here that's contributed to this so I think that there are definitely parents who are just like I just don't want to deal with this anymore mm -hmm. and then yeah there are a lot of parents like mine who were just so desperate and at the end of their rope and if your child is actively using drugs that could kill them and they've overdosed or they've made a suicide attempt or they've cut to the point of needing stitches like you're terrified for their life and you would do whatever it takes to try and keep them safe and places like this are offering you a solution so I think a lot of parents like go there because they're just so desperate. I think like the interventions just get like progressively more extreme. Like you start with the therapy and meds and then that doesn't work. And then you go to the next step and then you get to the point where, yeah, you're like paying people to come, like take your child in the middle of the night because you just don't know what to do anymore. Yeah. 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 And I think it's, it is because we, I think there's two things going on. One, we don't recognize how messy this is. 
like even parents that I see, they're like, just tell us what to do. What do we do? And it's like, I don't even know. You don't know, but like what you've been doing isn't working. These outsourcing your kid is not working. It's if anything, it's making them worse. Um, so it's not like, I always think, and maybe this is radical, but I know you'll agree with me in some sense. I'm always like, you got to make the program that you're seeking in your own home. And like the whole home needs work. Like everyone in the family, this is a whole system that the kid is reacting to. This did not happen overnight. This has been years, but like parents don't want to hear that. And I'm not doing it in a blaming way. I'm not trying to say like, this is your fault or you did this to your kid. It's like, no, life's problems are messy. The mental health industry acts like it's really easy. And just here, take this pill and you'll, you'll be yeah. fine. Come back in a month. It doesn't yeah. work like that. Look what happened because we didn't solve the problem. Now it's even worse. And now you got more problems on top of the original problem. And right. your kid turns into something. And I'm sure you had this experience. You turn into something else. Like that's not how you started. But yes. now it's like, yes. what do you got to say about that? Well, I think like, you know, there's this, um, well, I guess it's not a theory it's proven, but like learned helplessness. Like if you're in an environment and that could be your home where people are like looking at you, like you're mentally ill and sick and everyone is reflecting that identity back to you, you become that. And I think like, especially in, in some of the environments I was in, like, um, I haven't even talked about the boarding school yet. And like, we'll see how much we've talked is like, that's a whole story. But um, the boarding school that I went to and many, many others, like they literally like copy pasted their program from a cult that existed in the sixties called Synanon. And those, their kind of methods, like they like breed sociopathy. Like they like breed just this like cruel indifference to other people's emotions and you're putting teenagers in these like very artificial controlled environments where then they have to be like kind of looking out for their peers and giving their peers confrontations and being compliant with the rules. And so there are all of these different, um, you know, indicators of therapeutic progress that are coming from these environments and settings that are not at all, this is what I was saying, like honoring people's own instincts or philosophies. Like you're learning to just like be like compliant. So I was just thinking of that when you're saying like you come out of something you're not, because if you spend like years of your life in these environments where people are always telling you like what's right and what's wrong and how to be like, you completely lose like who you are and you become like a carbon copy of like what they've decided is like a healthy person. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. This is such a good thing. Um, Because I, I see it too. When people come out of psych med withdrawal, they're like, Angie, I've been on meds for 20 years. I don't even know who I am. Like I haven't even had feelings. And I don't, and I've, I've gone through that myself where I'm like, I don't even know, for instance, I'm seven and a half years off meds and I'll have problems come up to in my life. And I'll say, oh God, I'm thinking about this wrong, or I need to like, look at it differently, or um, I need to talk to somebody about this. And yeah, sometimes I do. Okay. Like a friend, but I'm always like, it's made me like neurotic and self-reflective and always looking at my feelings and always monitoring my symptoms. Like it's become like its own neur- neurosis because of where, yes. I, where I've, because I yes. was in therapeutic settings for so many years, that has, that's become who I am. Not instead of like, who am I really? Who, what do I like? What goals do I have? It's everything is, I'm just constantly self-reflecting. Yeah. Yeah. It almost sounds like, like it's like made you doubt your own perception yeah. of things. Like yeah. you're like, I must be wrong about this. Like I can't trust myself. You can't. Yeah. And especially like, think about and I'm thinking about teens too. You guys are coming of age or we're, yeah. all, we're all coming of age and you're exploring ideas and identities. And like, you might dress emo one week and then you're a raver the next week and yeah. then you're a freak and you know, like you're trying, you know, maybe yeah. I'm gay. I'm not sure. Like I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure out who I am in the world. And then mm-hmm. your very behavior or your personality is pathologized. And it's like, how am I supposed to have an identity if now I'm just this mentally ill, sick thing, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. So, so that remember, leads us to go, go ahead. But oh, well, no, I was just going to make like, just like, my mother, like when I was in wilderness, um, we all did like psych testing and I remember getting my sheet and it had like 13 different like diagnoses on it. Oh and I, even at that point, I remember like looking at one of them, it was like oppositional defiance oh disorder. And I was like, this is not a disorder. Like you're like watching me go to the bathroom. Of course I'm pissed off. Like, that's why I'm acting this way. Like it's a natural response. 
And one of me and one of my friends are, we made just as like a joke. Cause like, you have to like have like humor when you're in these places because they'll just like kill you. If you don't, we made like a bingo card with like all the different diagnoses. And when like someone else would like come in, would be like, let's see if you like have bingo. Oh my God. <laughs> like if you have, Oh, you have like oh PTSD, like, okay. Like check. Like, <laughs> um, but I, th- I just wanted to echo what you were saying. I feel like teenagers this is like so such a major feature of like the adolescent brain is they're seeking belonging and they're seeking their place in the world. And if you give someone at that point, like that inflection in their journey, like an identity of like, you are sick and like, this is what's wrong with you. Like they'll carry that throughout their life most of the time, unless they decide like, I actually am going to actively like release this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But sorry, I feel like I cut you off or you were. No, gonna- you didn't. No, keep going. No, I, I was thinking we got to talk about identity now. Oh, um, yes. That's yeah. where we're, le- we're he- so like May is Mental Health Awareness Month. There is a teen mental health crisis, hospitalizations for psychosis, for major depression. They all went up through COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, the medication that teens are on now is at the, the highest level ever. Every teen that I know, even in my own family, maybe not some of them, but they either have a therapist, they have a diagnosis, or they take medication. Just about mm-hmm. every teen that I know. So, um, I just, I want to know from your point of view, like, what is this teen mental health crisis about? How does mental health intersect with identity when you're coming of age? That's such an interesting question. I think like, okay, so I think the crisis, I think there's like a few, well, there's probably way more than a few, but some of the things that I think are contributing to it is like, I think that like teenage, well, everyone, but I think teenagers especially like actually need a healthy degree of struggle, like a developmentally appropriate degree of struggle. And like our lives are so convenient now, but like, I wouldn't say like people are like happier for it all the time in some ways. Yeah. But I think like most teenagers feel really lost because they don't have a way to like always exercise that instinct towards like self mastery. Um, and I think like when people, when they don't have like an outlet for that, it's like, they almost like create it in their minds. Like they're like, Mm -hmm. I just feel like something's wrong. Like there's this Mm -hmm. like constant sense of like dissatisfaction. And I think like a lot of teenagers, um, just don't have like their core needs met. Like, I know it's, it's so like, everyone says this like, oh, like smartphones and social media, but there was this huge report by the CDC about the teenage mental health crisis, specifically for teen girls. And a lot of the figures, like you can't ignore how it's risen with smartphones and social media. And when I think about like what teenagers really, like their core needs to feel like they can thrive and like have success and health is like, they need like belonging, like they need to feel like they belong with people. They need to feel like witnessed and seen and they need to feel hope and they need to feel like competency. Like they need to feel like I'm actually going to be okay. Like I know that I can like make it in the world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of teens just don't have those needs met. And I think like with like social media, especially like that phenomenon, like encourages people to think more about how their life looks versus how it feels. And like teenagers, have grown up with that sort of like coloring their perception of life. And you can't like isolate that to be like, well, I'm only going to feel that way about Instagram. Like you start to look at other people that way and think about yourself that way. Like you're not a person, you're just like some, you know, identity or this like commodity to be observed. Um, So I think like a lot of teenagers like take that mentality to their life and they're just so concerned and like caught up with appearances and like, you know, just like chasing all this stuff. And there's not a lot of places that I see the teens that I work with actually feel like these are people that I have that I feel seen by. This is a place where I go, where I feel I can make mistakes and learn and grow. And like, those are such core needs for development. And I think like where the, um, the mental health piece comes into it is, um, like the, yes, like the teenage brain as I've said, is like trying to find identity and belonging. And a part of that is like their brains are actually primed to crave like immense amounts of social information. Mm-hmm. Like they're wanting that they're Cause they are, you know, needing to navigate the world and like be able to observe like social norms and hierarchies and structures and stuff. 
So they're like taking in all this information, like they're taking it in from like social media and they're not able to like contextualize all of that. And so I think like where, sorry, it's a little disjointed, but no, it's, I, I, make sense. The, make sense. I think where like the mental health part comes in is like, they're looking for answers too. They're like, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel so alone and so wrong inside? And that's how like I felt. I feel, I felt so empty and I felt just wrong. Like everything about me and like everything around me was just wrong. And I wanted to know why I felt that way. And so if you serve someone an answer on a plate and it's like, oh, it's because you have like depression, you have generalized anxiety disorder, you have borderline personality disorder, then people are like, oh, this is the reason. And then that becomes in a way almost their salvation because it like answered this like gnawing need to just understand why they felt so off. Wow. That comes in. Teachers like attached to that. And then they almost don't want to let go of it because it's like they built their whole framework at that age around them being mentally ill. And that explains their feeling of disease with the world. That's like a lightning bolt. <laughs> like, I'm serious. It makes so much sense because, oh, I just have all these, like, all these words floating through my head, like instinct, belonging, yes. connection, performative, like performative, it's yeah. performative. That's the word yeah. I like yeah. even I see, even I see it. I'll go to a national park, and yeah. this is all you see is teens, like or or adults. Yes. Everyone, they're Dude. just like this is me in this river, and then they yeah. put the phone down and they just grumpily walk back to their car, and there was yeah. nothing, there, there was nothing like depth about it. It was a yeah. performance, and they put it on Instagram, and everybody thinks our life is, is great, yeah. and then you connect with that. But that's like an alt, uh, what's the word? Like another dimension of reality. Yes, like, that's one reality, and this is the other this is the other and yes. this one I feel lonely like my parents don't see me like mm-hmm. they're working all the time and I don't have a deep relationship with them mm-hmm. and then I have to go to a therapist to try to get that need met yeah. to have human connection and have someone see me yes oh my god it's heartbreaking yeah really you captured that is- so perfectly like I will say like wilderness despite you know it's many flaws like I appreciated that so much because I had never had a break from social media in my life or just, you know, technology and just the world that we live in, all the the noise and the pressure of it. And so when I was in the middle of nowhere in the woods and the only clock I had was the sun, I was just like, I kind of felt amazing because I was like, this actually feels real to me. I'm actually aware of how I feel in my body. I'm talking to someone and we're not, I don't know how many followers they have. I don't know. Like who they've dated in our grade. Like we're just talking, we're just like connecting like human to human. And it's amazing. Like how rare that experience is for so many young people and adults. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I sometimes just witness things because I'm alone most of the time. You know, I, I, I work with clients all day, but then I go in the world and I'm in all different cities and I'm just very curious person and I'm waking up from my own nightmare and I'm trying to reconnect with my own life. So like my travels is my healing is my, whatever it's on my terms, but I'll sit and I'll watch like people at a park and there'll be like 10 people and they're just standing there with their dogs and their dogs are playing and they're all on their phones. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just, and I see it. I see it in all different kinds, con- even at the bus stop when I was in college, everybody at the bus stop was on their phone. No one would talk to each other. And I'm like, this is just so sad. Like, I want to talk to you and get to know you and like, what makes you tick? And like, th- either they're not interested or it's hijacked or dopamine in such a way that you can't even connect. Like break away from it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me sad. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But this is huge. I feel like you got to write a paper about that or something. <laughs> like, I'm serious. It's like, it makes so much sense to me, but yeah, let's, let's talk about this one last thing before we move on to the next subject. Yeah. Like in that moment, when someone gives you a diagnosis and it explains, like you say, mm-hmm. I, my old argument was you can get that validation from someone else to say, yeah, you're going through something really hard and it's not going to make sense. And it's going to be really messy and you're going to be in a lot of pain, but it's normal for what happened to you. Like, so maybe they get validation without a diagnosis, but the way that you're saying it, the diagnosis is making, making the world make sense to the person because there's these two different realities. So I don't know, how can we give teens what they need without the mental health covering, I guess? I don't know. Like, what have you seen? Like, what has actually worked? What helps? What, what's an alternative? I don't know. To um, 
like to treatment or to just like try and oh to yeah. treatment diagnosis treatment yeah or... I think like the main I feel like the main issue with treatment is just like how it creates yeah like just like this like separation especially like in the kind of treatment that like I want to that's you know like residential like whether you're in the woods or you're in a board like my boarding school was in a castle <laughs> like in you know a boarding school like you're away from home so when you do go home when I went home I I was like, I I don't even know how to begin describing like what I've been through and no one here has any shared language for what I've been learning or how I've been trying to practice communicating. Um, So I think that that's like the piece that most programs miss is kids are like dropped in. Yeah. These like artificial, like synthetic cultures. And then they go back home and like nine times out of 10, like they relapse in like really serious ways Mm -hmm. because they haven't learned how to heal within their home environment and within their family system, within their community. And also within the context of like, this is an experience that I'm going through and not something that deems me unfit to be around other people. So I do think like there are, I think there's like a real need for teenagers, as I was saying, like to have opportunities to just have their core needs met. And I think that can like look many different ways. Like for some teenagers that is being on a sports team and they feel like I'm learning new skills. I'm going, I'm being responsible and like accountable, like going to practice. I have a community of teammates that I feel connected to. Like there's so many ways it can look. Um, but I think like sometimes those, well, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. The reason I'm bringing that up is because I think we've talked about too, like the lack of initiation and rites of passage, yes. and that, like adolescence, as we said, is like by nature, like kind of a confusing time where teenagers are trying to figure out where do I fit in the world? And I think they really need that ushering into adulthood of like, you are actually like becoming your own person and you want to give back. You're needed in the community in these ways. Like you are a part of your family, you're a part of your school, your friend group, like whatever it is, like you do belong. And like you learn that you do have the capacity to like overcome challenge and you can like be an adult and you're going to be okay. So there are like still lots of rites of passage, like getting your license or like your first job. Like, but when I think back to like my first job, I worked at a bakery. Like there was never a, dis- we, I like learned about like food safety, but there was never a discussion about like, Hey, it's important that like you be accountable to these people. Like people depend on you. Like that's an important part of like becoming an adult. So I think having opportunities where that is presented to them, like with like really intentional, like modeling from other adults wow, is really important. And like, I love nature. So like, that's like my kind of go to I'm like you should like go backpacking you should like go in nature but really just like having adults who model like I was like model like model accountability and authenticity and who have like ideally been through some of the same challenges like I felt so different when I finally met adults who had been through some of the things I'd been through because I was like oh my god you're like living breathing proof that there's like another side to this and you can relate to me. Like you make me then feel like not alone. And I can now understand this is a part of a journey that people go through. It's like a feature of the human experience. Mm -hmm. It's not a flaw. Like it's not like a disease. So I've said so many different things, but I I really am just trying to speak to like environments and like settings that honor the core needs for like mastery, belonging, um, and connection. Agency, trust, vulnerability, being seen, being heard treated yeah. like like you said in your bio humanity the humanity yeah. of teens and I was like yes I know another woman I've connected you with her I think but if not we'll do it later but Avani Dilger in uh, Boulder Colorado who um she she runs a nonprofit called Natural Highs and she teaches teens about you can get high without using drugs like in different mm-hmm. ways you know but m- me and her had a conversation a long time ago and I was like people always say, Angie, you're so good with kids. You're so good with teens. And I'm like, cause I treat them like human beings. <laughs> like human beings. <laughs> it's so, what do you mean? I'm not doing anything special, but it, it just speaks to like, even teachers, like not all teachers, yeah. like, I, teachers like really impacted my life, you know? Cause like yeah. at home I wasn't being seen. So I needed some out, out another human, you know, another adult to see me. So my mm-hmm. teachers were really impactful, but it's at a certain point, like we as a society I think we're just like oh 
those crazy teens or like they don't get it or you know I'm worried about our future like we just other them somehow you know and look at how little we don't even see them and we ignore them on purpose almost yeah we said something really interesting too like I've thought about which is like I feel like people, I feel like these days it's like so common that people live like very, very far from their families and there's not, and I'm not saying there's like anything like inherently wrong with that, but I think that it, there didn't used to maybe be as much pressure on like the parents to be like all of that because people maybe had like aunts and uncles or Mm. teachers or coaches and it's still due to some extent, but I think that's really important. Like if people don't, are not getting that from their parents, because like parents are flawed human beings who often have their own unresolved challenges like you need that from someone else like you need to have adults in your life when you're growing up that you feel as you were describing you felt with your teenage your teachers like that they saw you Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. so let's talk about healing how did you maybe you want to talk about the therapeutic boarding school really quick but tell me like how did you figure out wait a minute there's nothing wrong with me or like what realization did you come to and how did you heal and how did you get to where you are now Mm -hmm. So it's interesting you say that boarding school was like that actually was in some ways for how awful it was. It was kind of like a catalyst for my, you know, um, waking up. So as I said, like the boarding school kind of operated like a cult. Um, it, they used like brainwashing tactics. They used really abusive punishments like sleep deprivation. Wow. Um, and it was really like, focused on this method called like attack therapy. So like our groups would be like sitting in a room, like everyone's in a room and there were maybe like 25 students. There was really, really small and group would be focused on a person and everyone would have to confront them. And like, people would just say like the meanest, meanest, like cruelest things. Like you cannot believe what people would say here. And that was how people showed, as I said, like you know, the term that they used was like moral leadership. Like that was how you showed you were giving back in the community. You were helping other people grow. You were being honest with them. Oh my God, so and twisted. So, it's so twisted. And like the school had, I mean, there's, I could talk again. There's like- Is this so- place still open or can we like file it was the place? Closed. Okay, yeah, thank God. Oh my God. Was I was like, closed. I feel like this is yeah. mandated reporter territory. Okay. No, I, I, I know. It's, like, tell me. <laughs> I know I'm like telling you and you're like, I'm like, I gotta call somebody. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Keep going. I'm glad it's um, closed. Okay. And they, yeah, it, it closed like two years ago and there was so many really screwed up things. It was called the John Dewey Academy and it's pretty like notorious in this world because it was severely abusive. Um, and so they had like different level systems there too, where if you were a new, if you were, there were four levels and if you were the bottom two, which was like younger member or prospective member and younger member, you couldn't actually speak to each other. Like you could only speak to people who were the higher levels who had basically already been indoctrinated and they would just be telling you like, you have to stay here. Like this place saved my life. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like just gaslighting was just like actually like the way of things there. Like I was seeing abuse happen around me constantly. Like people being like, yeah, like made to go like sleep in the basement for like 10 days, you know, like things like that. And, or wear like degrading cardboard signs around their neck. And I would say at the beginning, I would be like, this is really screwed up. Like, this is not okay. Like, I don't want to be here. And people would just like say back to me all the time, well, you're going to kill yourself. If you leave, you'll spend your whole life in a hospital. You're a crazy person. Like my head, the headmaster of the school, like said to me, he was like, if you leave, like you'll be dead in two weeks, like you'll kill yourself in two weeks. And I ended up like, actually it's like a, like a long story, but I was supposed to be there for two years and I was only there for nine months, which was not nothing. That was a hellish nine months. Yeah. But I, I basically like ran away. Like I created like an escape plan because I got to a point where I was like, I don't care that everyone's telling me that I'm crazy and that this is okay. Like, I know, like there is like, some piece of me, there's some like kernel of like insight that just knows this is not okay. And that I'm not the one who's crazy here. No. (laughs) So I left, uh, yeah, like I left the school. So that was kind of like the first, so as I was saying, yeah, like it was a really painful way to come to that realization, but being in that environment where I was almost forced to 
to trust myself where I was like, everyone's telling me that I'm the one who's wrong here, but I know that I'm not like, that was like a very powerful moment for me. And then I never went back on meds. I came off all my meds, um, around that time too, but I did go back to therapy when I was in college. And then that was kind of the second time where I was like, I'm coming here and I'm talking about the same thing every week. And I don't feel any different. Like, how is it that like, after all this time, I am still so far from home. And that was when I was like, okay, I have to like find another way. Like this is, this just can't be it. Mm-hmm. So then, then what'd you do? There wasn't like one thing that I did. It wasn't as if, you know, like I discovered, yeah. um, you know, like breath work and that no, like, no, no. My yeah. life. like it was a million different things. It sounds like you, you like withdrew your belief in the system was going to fix you. And you like, just like me, you have to figure it out. Wait a minute. Like I'm doing everything they're telling me to do. I'm doing all, you know, and why I don't know why it's not working. I don't know why I'm different. Or maybe that makes me worse off because it's not working for me, but like, this isn't working and I can't do it anymore. Like you just get disillusioned, you know? Yes. Yes. And then you just like find your own way. So like, what kind of things did you do? Or like, what did, what was that like? That whole leaving um yeah well it it was exactly as you said like I just became disillusioned with it I was just like this is not helping me right now maybe at some at some point in the past it was helpful maybe it might be for other people but like it's not helping me and I at first had those thoughts where it's like it must be me like I must just be so damaged that nothing can help me um I was like the first things I started doing was um more like somatic work, mm-hmm. like actually going into like the body and working with like trauma release. Mm-hmm. And I think probably the biggest part was I just found people that I really respected and really admired and felt really safe with mm-hmm. like different mentors, figures who I was like, you figured something out. Like I actually look at you and I'm like, I want to know what, you know, I want to learn from you. And that was like probably the guiding um, instinct that I had was there weren't many, cause like, you don't really know anything about your therapist. Like they don't tell you anything no, about they're their not therapist. allowed to, they're no. not allowed to. So like, I was like, who am I taking advice from? Like, oh, I don't good point. know anything about you. And then I'm thinking of one woman who I love dearly. Her name is Gigi. And I like met her, I was living in San Francisco and I just, just like, I just like, I have so much admiration for you. I feel like inspired by you. Like you're, you're inspiring to me. Yeah. I was like, what can I learn from you? And she did trauma release and, um, meditation and, you know, many different things. And so that was kind of how I went my healing way. It was definitely a lot of time in nature. I think that is the greatest medicine I agree. agree. And just finding people who I was like, you inspire me. I love that. It's so simple. Look, yeah. listen how simple that is. And that's my, that's always my, uh, my argument for coaching. Like yeah. I have my own coach that he has, he has something that I want that I look up to. He yeah. keeps me motivated. He keeps me inspired. Other people, they hire me as a coach because they see that in me. I know you're doing your own thing, but it's like, we all, you don't have to, you don't have to be a professionalized coach, you know, but even YouTube, I watch Andrew Huberman videos. I'm inspired oh, by them. I'm yeah. like, I'm going to be smart like him, you know, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, people like, I mean, Mel Robbins kind of annoys me sometimes, but like, Pima, <laughs> you know, like I watch all these, I get all these voices that mm-hmm. give me new ideas on like how to live. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm feeling my way. Cause I have my own waking up process. Like I'm still yeah. waking up. I'm always changing. Yeah. I'm always trying to grow, but I, I, I too have, even now I'm disillusioned with therapy. Like, I just don't want to do it. Like I just not getting anything out of it. They don't want to talk about medical trauma. They don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like that idea though. Yeah. Of like, where can you get what you're missing or who can you look up to? Who can you emulate Mm -hmm. who? Cause I think in a way that's reflecting back to you, something deep in you that is, isn't getting, you know, that need isn't getting met or something that you want to aspire to. It's helping you grow. Yes. So that's good. I love that. Reminds me of that quote. I think it's something like all the beauty you see in someone else is a reflection of you or something like that. But exactly as you're saying, it's like, they're showing you something that you want to aspire to, or you want to cultivate or create Mm -hmm. not outside of you. It's like, they're just in there. Yeah. It's in there. They're just helping you bring it out. 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So can you tell me, cause I've heard a couple times yeah. about homing home. <laughs> I lost my way instinct. So tell me yeah. what homing instincts is and like what you're doing right now in the world. Yeah. So <laughs> thinking about metaphors, the name definitely came from metaphor. Cause when I was wanting to name, you know, like the project and just what I do, like have a name for the platform, I was thinking, okay, like I am such a practitioner and believer in the power of nature. And so many of the wilderness therapy programs, like they have, you know, like metaphorical names like that, like elements or like second nature, like they touch on that (laughs) because they love that stuff. And Hey, I love it too. So I was thinking about what to call it. And I was like, oh, I could call it like grounded or like, you know, something having to do with like earth or, um, you know, like instinct. And, um, I was, it just wasn't like hitting though. Like I was, you know, kind of cycling through these names. Like it just wasn't really hitting. And then I remembered that animals, so many animals like bears and like, I think pigeons is another big one have a homing instinct. Like they literally have this inborn ability to return home so after true. being very far away. And I think like when I think of healing, there's, there is a lot of like unlearning and relearning, but it's a lot about remembering. It's like remembering what you already know. And I know you believe this too, like your body knows how to heal. Like someone does not have, some can hold the light for you while you're like stumbling and finding your way, but no one is teaching you how to heal. Like you already have that ability within you. And so I wanted to name it that because that captures like what, what I believe about like people having an instinct and an ability to heal. And then I also kind of appreciated that it had the word home in it because I think, especially as I work with adolescents, like the family system is so important. So I appreciated that it had like kind of a nod to like the home environment. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what I do, I mostly work virtually. I work, as you said, like a coach, like a mentor for teens and with parents as well. I'd say it's more with teens, but I often work with parents too. Mm -hmm. And I do parent support groups online And I do some, I've done some in-person day retreats for teen girls, Um, but most of my work is virtual and outside of offering like coaching and mentorship, I write too. So I try to share about like some of the pieces that like we've touched on today Mm -hmm. as well. I think that's just so beautiful. It's a remembering going home because I think, oh my God, it just makes me want to cry. Cause I, I always ask when I get a new client, like what? what were you like before this happened to you? Who is the person that you know yourself to be before, you know, meds? And they'll be like, I was really fun loving and I was super caring and I was thoughtful and I love being with my family and this and this and this. And then they somehow lost their way with an eager need, a very pure need to feel better or to be seen or to get some need met that they weren't getting met. That's why we enter the mental health system. And then you turn out, like we said earlier, it becomes something else and you hardly recognize yourself anymore. So when I, then I ask them, why do you want to do this? What, what is driving you to come off of medications? And they'll always say like, I'm just curious. I want to know what my baseline is. I want to feel healthy again. I want to know what I'm like. Like there's this, this pure curiosity to return home. (laughs) Makes me want to cry. Sorry. Don't be sorry. I'm tearing up too. I know. Yeah. So I don't know why that got me so hard today. Um, yeah, but it's just so sad. That's it. Um, and they just do a great disservice by interrupting that process and taking you off, you know, take you off the trail for a long time. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to talk about teens, like just the troubled teen. Okay, that's an archetype now that we have the troubled teen. Yeah. So we all know one or love one or have one in our families. Mm-hmm. And I know I have some clients with what the industry, you know, mental health or otherwise would call troubled teens. So I don't know. What do you think troubled teens need to know, like from your point of view or what can help them? And then parents, if they are a parent of a troubled teen, like what advice would you give both? Um. I think I would say like, there's great wisdom in your being troubled. It's because you have absorbed something or um, 
you feel like you have an intuitive sense about something, but like you are not, you're not crazy for feeling the way that you feel. And um, when I was in wilderness, I remember one of the guides, I forget how he phrased it, but he was talking about that, about like, it is often people who are like very sensitive and have, um, you know, a lot of pain inside that end up in these, these states or like these times of life. So I think troubled teens are like warriors. Like I think they're, they can be a real pain in the ass for parents. I'm not denying that, but like, there is some, there's some like fighter instinct in them that is like, this isn't okay. And I'm not gonna, not gonna like, I'm going to burn buildings down. Like, I'm not going to just like let this pass by. So I think what I would say to troubled teens is like, know that whatever it is that is causing this distress in your life, if it is your sensitivity, is it, if it is like your anger or, you know, even like, like your defiance, whatever it is, like there's a wisdom in that and there's gifts in that. And it's about like uncovering those and like learning how to become the master of that energy. But I would just want them to know, like, there's nothing wrong with you that you feel this way. And also it's such like an overused phrase, but like, it does get better. Like When you're young, if you've lived your whole life, and even if you're an adult, I shouldn't say if you're just young, but just because we're talking about teens, like Mm -hmm. lived your whole life feeling like I don't belong anywhere and there's something wrong with me. Like, of course, it's hard to have hope that you're going to feel differently. You don't have a reference point of feeling differently. So I would just say to them, like, your whole life could be different in a year. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, I like that. That that I think I was thinking back to I was like, I didn't even talk about me as a teen. But me as a teen, I reacted to my context too. I didn't uh burn buildings down, but I dyed my hair purple and I carried a lunchbox and I wore crazy clothing and I messed with things that I shouldn't, you know, like dangerous situations. Um, but it was a reaction to all girls Catholic high school, the pressure of making straight A's. My grandparents were paying for it. And I felt like I was letting them down because I was getting C's, you know, and then changing to public high school. And then I just said, I quit everything. I'm not playing soccer no more. I'm not playing softball. I'm not doing nothing. I put my foot down. Like I give up. I'm not doing this, this pressure thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So I I really like that, that, that you said, like, there's this energy that, you know, I'm mad about something, but that madness is not mental illness. Yeah. 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 It's not. It's a reaction to what is happening and this is not right. Or I don't look like these girls on Instagram and why not? And why don't I feel something, you know, or why don't I feel good in my body or why don't I have a connection? There's just, oh God, there's so much good stuff that you said. I can't even believe it. Um, I want to see this lunchbox of a picture, but I'm so curious. Oh my God. I don't even know. I started a trend. Like back then I went to the Miss Kitty store, the Japanese store. It was like Miss Ki- Hello Kitty. Oh, the- Hello- oh Yeah. And I, I mean, this is 25 years ago. I was carrying those stupid little, more than that, 35 years ago. I'm carrying around. <laughs> no, not, I'm 44. So that was like 30 years ago. I'm carrying around a stupid little lunchbox. Anyway, <laughs> at school, it was like the coolest thing. But I started a trend. Is, I love that because that to me is like reflective of like your spirit. Like, it's like, you were like, I'm trying to just put my foot down and be like, this is who I am. Like, this is what I yeah. care. This is like something that brings me joy. Yeah. Like, it was joy and it was see yeah. me. I'm gonna stick out. I want to be yeah, gonna stick out. And wild and I yeah. want and I was always a creative person and I was emotional and mm-hmm. like that was my ex- self-expression. Like I'm gonna wear plaid pants and a purple shirt and mismatched socks and hot pink uh yeah. platform shoes. I did that. Oh, I literally did epic. that. Yeah. <laughs> but I was just reacting. Okay. Anyway, we said so much good stuff. So what can we I don't I didn't even look at my my little list of questions. We just went off the cuff. I think I hit what I was wanted to talk to you about, but yeah, I don't know. What do you want to leave us with? Like, what do you want to say? Anything left unsaid? Um, I think, well, one thing I, I, I guess I would say to parents. Oh yeah. Parents. It's like the most important thing for parents is like that they don't yield to like their child's belief that like they're broken. Cause like, as we're talking about all this, like Oftentimes it is like the teenager who's like, no, I am like, you know, really sick and I am not okay. And they're starting to see themselves as we're talking about as like broken and um, mentally ill. And I think like a lot of parents, like it's well-meaning, but they kind of like climb into that story with them. And they're like, yeah, we're going to get you all the help. We're going to get you all the therapists. We're going to get you all the meds. 
And whatever like route parents go, like one thing I would say is like, please just be open to like other avenues for healing. Mm. But like, I think children and teens, like they feel how their parents feel about them. Oh yes. Think your child is broken. Like they will feel that. So even if they're doing a lot of things that would make you believe that about them, like to just try and like hold the belief and like the knowingness that like they are infinitely capable and powerful and like, they're going to be okay because they will feel that too. Yeah. That's huge. Because I think if you see someone adult or teen or otherwise, if you see someone through the lens of mental illness, like my yeah. child is reacting, they're mentally ill. This is a chemical imbalance. They need to take their pills and go to therapy. There's nothing I can do to help them. That's a very hopeless line of belief. Yeah. You know what I mean, if you yeah. see them as infinitely wise, as they're having an instinct, they're not getting their needs met. How can I foster the agency and mentor them to be yeah. a good adult and to know what to do with all the energy and all the chaos and all the feelings that they have? How can I see them? How can I love them unconditionally? Like focus on that. Like, yeah. I just feel like that's two totally different ways to look at the same thing. And how, which one do you choose? Yeah. You know? 100% beautiful oh my gosh okay so tell everybody how they can reach you um anything you want to say about your website or coaching or mentorship or I don't know what do, what do you call yourself it's not, I use the word mentor yeah I like that I like yeah that. It's, it's hard to decide but, what, but what people I. definitely understand more what when I say coach like when I say a mentor they're just like what <laughs> like, <laughs> and I hate the word coach honestly yeah. but it's like that's the only word I can think of that people understand you know but people but, recognize yeah because like I don't know if you have like the elevator pitch down with people like what do you do I'm like do you have five minutes like I don't know what, what do you say what's your elevator pitch let me hear it I'll tell um, you mine. I say that well I, I guess like I, I often say like how I got started I say like I'm yeah a mentor and consultant for like struggling teens and their families Perfect. and I say like you know I had a lot of challenges as a teen I was in a lot of different treatment environments and when I got older I started writing about some of my experiences online and writing in support groups and people just started reaching out to me. And then one day a woman was like, how much do you charge? And I was like, oh, I don't charge. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah. oh, maybe I could like make Wait. this a, a service Yeah, because a lot of people get a lot of value out of it um, for probably the same reason that people get value out of you, like yeah. you understand their experience in such an intimate way. And you can be there or like, like people can like calibrate to you because you've been through the challenge and you mm -hmm. are where you are now. Yeah. 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 No. And, and I like, there's a phrase, I can't remember who said it, but a therapist can only take you as far as they've gone themselves or a person can only take you as far as they, you know, like that's yeah. why therapists don't yeah. work in my space because you've never been through psych med withdrawal. How, and if anything, the clients that I see, they've had trauma from going to a therapist, trying to explain it. It's like, yeah. You can't, you have to get this from somebody who's been through it. You, when someone dies, you go to a grief support group and you talk to people that are going through the grief together. You know, I think that's the, I, I know therapists don't like to, they, we always say like, oh, you don't have to have the experience of post-traumatic stress to understand how, you know, uncomfortable that is. I get that to an extent, but like yeah. this experience or you being in a teen therapeutic settings, your whole personality was pathologized since you were eight years old, how how I don't, I can't even relate to you because I haven't been through that experience. You know, I can in some levels, but yeah, not, yeah. not, you know, to the depth. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. hundred percent. Like people can have compassion. Cause like there's things you've been through that I haven't been through and yeah, I can still compassion. You no, know, relate. there's compassion, but like, I understand why if you wanted to talk to someone who understood a really particular part of your struggle, you would go to someone who understood a really particular part of your struggle. It's just like, you won't go to, for a hip hip replacement surgery. You don't go to an internist. You go to an orthopedic yeah. surgeon who specializes in hips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Okay. Anyway, yeah. we could talk for hours and hours. I know. I know, Andy, this was why we did this. The first time we talked, it was like, we <laughs> <talk> <laughs> yeah. oh my God, but I just wish you the best of luck Kira. And um, anytime anybody asks for, I actually have an email in my inbox right now and I'm going <laughs> to, you're going to be on something very soon because you're the person first per perfect person to slip in there. But I'm just here for you. If you need anything as a mentor, as a sister, as a friend, whatever you need, I just oh adore God. you. I just think you're going to kick ass and you're going to keep changing the paradigm in teen mental health and helping parents and teens navigate. Cause it's so messy, but you get it. You get all the levels. You got it through hard and experience just like me. 
Yeah. And Angie, thank you for being my first interview, my first podcast. Thank you for bringing me in and helping me and giving me so much support. Welcome. Let's do this. And you being an inspiration to me too. Big time. Thank you so much. All right. Everybody in the audience. Thank you. If you're on YouTube, will you please hit subscribe? I have like (laughs) 10% only our subscribers. All the other people that watch are non-subscribers. Please just hit subscribe, like the video, share it. If you're on Facebook live, share it. If, mm-hmm. if you want to get in contact with Kira, what is the email or what's the, um, my email is Kira C I A R A at homeinginstinct.org, but you can go to the website and there's like a contact form there too. Homeinstinct.org. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody have a wonderful yeah. day.